Hello. Hello. How are you? Good, yourself? Okay, I think I've got everything set up. So let's get started. Hope everyone's doing well um, in our stay at home state. Okay. Um, so let's talk first about um, projects. Um, I want it's time for people to sort of think about the projects, what they want to do. Um, so next Thursday, I want, I won't be lecturing. I want people to, you know, give a, you know, two to five minute, you know, discussion about what, the, what they want to do for their project. No formal presentation, just like, well, I want to build an app that's going to, um, you know, track my baby, doctor's appointments, and weights, et cetera. And then, so it's just um, a verbal description. And the, the goal is several fold. One is um, to get people to start thinking more concretely about it. Um, and also, some people want to. You know, basically reproduce all of Facebook and go, well, no, um, you're probably not going to be able to do that um, in the time remaining. So it's, the goal is to scope the project out to make sure that it's not too big or too small. Um, also try to make sure that you haven't, you've thought through um, all the various issues that you need to worry about. Any questions? Okay. There's I'm monitoring multiple windows to figure out what's going on. And so no questions. I'm fine, thank you. Okay. Um, I, I do have a question. Sure. Did you make the slides for today? Yes. I, um, I, I just posted them. Um, I apologize for being so late. I was making changes up until um, my last class started. It just took longer than I wanted it to do. Mm. Okay. No, I lost my chat window. Okay, there's my chat window. So what I'm talking about today is room. Um and room is an example of what people call OR layers or object relational layers, mapping layers. Um, 
And the problem is that when we write code, you know, we've got objects, you know, so here is a you know, Java class of a person, it has a name, you know, first name, last name, and age. Um, but when we <clears throat> put it in a database, what has to happen is we need that to take this class and map it to, you know, a table or there's a, and when we've got a simple um, mapping like this, you know, you know, basically the first name property can go to the first name field, last name property can go to last name, and age can map to age. Um, right. Uh, and then what happens is we have to deal with, now I need to create that SQL statement to, you know, take that first name property and put it in that particular column. Um, right, and so it, you know, um, it becomes a, well, We've got another class, another table. You now, again, the mapping is quite straightforward. And if you do this manually, after a few times, it becomes just a pain. Um, and so I started saying, well, can't we have a system that does this for us? I basically give it a map. Street goes to this column, city goes to that column, state goes to this column. and and have it generate the SQL for us. And so I just say, here's the object, go put it in the table, or I ask the table, give me, you know, you know, this address back. Um, and Room is Android's you know, layer to do this. It's gonna produce a mapping between our objects in our application and tables in um, SQL. And there are various pieces we have to worry about. Um, we create entities, um, which basically are data objects. Um, we create a data access object class which tells us how the mapping goes from our table to our um, object. And, you know, then the room database worries about sticking it into the database itself and pulling it out. So an entity, you know, maps to a, a table in the database um, and then the, the data is object or, you know, it's, you know, DAO or DAO, um, is how we access things from the database. Um, and so I wanna look at a simple example. Um, so it's gonna be a user class, um, which it find, it's a data class and it finds what the table is gonna look like. Um, the, um, we create an interface for the data assets object and room actually generates the object itself. And then we create a, a room um, database subclass and we, you know, we create one reference per table. To use room, we have to modify the build Gradle file. Um, if we just want room by itself, you know, in the build Gradle module app file, um, we need to add the Kotlin caps um, plugin, and then we add uh, the current version of room is 
and we need the implementation of the room and this KAPT or CAPT is basically a compiler to compile um, annotations. And we'll see the annotations shortly. Um, if you want to do more complicated things, um, if we want to use coroutines, the, some operations on a database, even though they're local, can be slow. Um, so Google recommends that you don't do um, certain database operations on the main thread. You want to do it on a background thread. And coroutines make that a little easier. So my example does that instead of using something like async task. Um, and then if we want um, to use live data, which is where things become really interesting, um, we need to add some more um, we need live data. We can use two models. And um, to use live data to implement the life cycle, the life cycle where we need and a few more things to our build create build out great gradle file. And I guess before I forget, um, I did solve my um, problem with Android Studio so I can actually run applications on my emulator and a device. So here I'm defining, um, you know, I did this in two ways and I meant to make this second way hidden, I forgot to do that. Um, so the long way of doing it is, first of all, I have this at ent entity, which is declaring this class um, to define an entity, which means it'll define a table. Um, and there's an annotation, that's why we need to cap the KAPT plugin to deal with this um, annotation. But first, I'm defining various properties, right? The first name, last name, and user ID. Um, and then what I'm doing is specifying that this property also defines a column, and I'm going to give it the name, column name, last underscore name. And Right, this attribute, right, is specifying that the following property should get mapped to a column called first name. And, right, I'm specifying that the UID is a um, primary key and I want to auto generate it for me so that I don't have to figure it out myself. Um, And so this is, and you know, the compiler is going to auto generate the code to create the table for us from this information. So we're basically doing two things at once. We're creating a class that we can use in our code. And we're also through the annotations creating a table that this is to be stored in. Um, we can use the primary um, constructor to shorten it. So um, I'm specifying it in the primary constructor, first name, last name, properties, and columns that go into. Right, so the shorter version, right, I'm just you know, here's my properties, 
Um, I pull the primary key out of um, the primary constructor um, because I didn't when I when I create my user object, I don't have want to worry about the primary key that's going to go in the database. I want to be generated for me. And if I put it in the primary constructor up here, every time I instantiate the object, I have to give it a value. Um, doing it down here, I don't have to worry about giving it a value. Here is um, my data access object to DAO. Um, again, we create an interface for it. And we have to specify that is my data access object with this annotation. And what we do here is we specify the mapping between a function call and the SQL that's going to perform that operation on the database. Um, let's see. Um, let's first take a look at my right, find by name. Um, so first I'm declaring function find by name and give the first name and last name. Um, and then I want to return a user object. Um, so that's what I will call it my Kotlin code. Um, now when I call that code, this is the SQL that's going to be called, right? So I'm specifying, you know, from this table, um, you know, select everything where the first name is like first and the last name is like last. And by the way, just return one. So we're still specifying the SQL that we want, we want to use. Um, but notice, right, we're, there is no implementation of the function. It's just name of the function, argument list, and return type, and then the annotation with the query we're supposed to do. You know, similarly, um, get all. Um, it's going to return a list of users, and the query is just, you know, select star from user table. So far, so good. Now, um, let's look at um, the delete, it's nice and simple. Um, again, it's just name the function um, argument and it's just annotation. We don't need to give the SQL um, because the delete annotation will know um, to find, take that particular user object um, and go into the user table, find it and delete it. We generate the SQL for us. Um, same thing with insert and the updates, right? We don't need the SQL for that. Okay. Now we can ask the question, my queries, and so to find the user table where is that specified? Um, 
there when we define my entity there are a number of defaults that are used in the entity i can specify the name of the table explicitly i have not done so here um, so they're going to use the name of the class as the name of the table now i've explicitly used specified the column names for each uh, property. If I didn't specify the column names, um, again, the default would be to use the names of the property themselves as the names of the column. So now I've created an entity. We created our data access objects. Now I need our um, room database. Um, and so we subclass room database. It's an abstract class um, because um, the compiler is going to generate the concrete implementation for us using these annotations. And I have to specify that this is my database, um, room database. There's a couple of things. Um, I need to specify which entities are going to be involved in this database. Um, and it's a list of them. Currently, I only have one entity, so I only list one, but if I had multiple entities, I would list multiple classes. Um, I also then need a function for each um, database access object I need. And uh, basically for each table or the entity, we want a data access, data access object. Um, since I only have one Entity, I'll need one function. Um, next thing to point out is, ah, uh, yes, um, versioning. Um, the issue here is, again, like I said, when we talk about SQL before the break, is that at some point in the future, you mean your application may change enough in version two or version three or version n where you need to modify the database that's on existing user's devices. And that um, is why we need a version number. Um, because when we need to modify the database, we will then increment that version number and then we need to provide the code to migrate from version one to version two or version one to version three etc now if you start using room there is one annoying feature you need to know about that relates to the emulator and i'm going to say it here and i'll say it later um when you run your application on the emulator and then you modify your schema your tables you may add another class for the table if you modify in this case my user class to add another property that, that any change that would change the structure of the database, adding columns, deleting columns, which corresponds to adding or deleting properties to your entity, adding more entities, adding more tables, any such change like that, um, they're considered to be a different version. And the database doesn't go away when you rerun your application on the emulator and your application will immediately crash. 
and then you a little panic. He's like, oh, what did I do wrong? Um, and you have to look at the, look at the log catch and find their message and they'll, they'll say, didn't change the version number. Um, the solution to that is you delete the application from the application before you make any such change. Clear? Maybe it's clear. Well, um, so the problem is you know, creating the database is expensive, it creates the tables, those sort of things. Um, so you only want to do it once. Um, and so here is the same class. Um, but I've added a companion object because Colin does not have the statics that Java does. Um, and so I created, you know, a pri private property to hold the database object. Um, I've got a method to give me that database object, but to create it, I need the contexts um, and so if the instance is still null I then you know call the code to actually create the database um, and so the database builder it needs a context um, Right, and it needs various information about the database class and the name of the database they want, and I can build it. There are other options we can give here. Um, if you've got data and resources you want to put into the database the first time, um, you do it here. Um, I won't talk about that today, but there are various things you can do to initialize the database in the very first time it's run. So once I've done that, um, you know, here's an example of inserting data into database and reading it. And it's, um, so here I get my database from my, my companion object. And now um, I need my debt, my, DOA, the assets object um, from the database. And now I can start calling those methods on it. So I'm calling insert all, and I've created two instances of um, users, and that adds it to the database. And then here I've got an example of you know reading from the database, finding by name. Um, and now what I did do is to avoid um, doing the database operations on the main thread. Um, I'm using the core routine, so I'm using the global scope launch to do it in the background. Um, and then when I've got my data, again, I'm calling, um, I'm launching that code on the main thread um, where names is a text field in my interface. And so I'm just sending a text. Um, and you have to admit that these using coroutines is a lot better than 
using async tasks. And so just, um, you know, once we set up our access object, um, you know, in the database is just calling those methods. Um, you know, passing in right objects um, and the dat database access OR layers and translating to SQL and sorting in the database on the device. And this find by name, right again, my code, I get to act at the function method level and the OR layer is then going to convert that to a SQL call, grab the data from the database and then populate it into an object and return the object to me. So we get to operate at a higher level um, and we don't have to worry about spewing SQL code scattered throughout our program. Any questions? No questions. Just trying to Okay. Now, there we go. Um, again, do an update. Um, so again, I'm doing everything um, off the main thread, and then at the very end, I move things back to um, main thread. And at the same, again, once they set the system up, it's pretty simple, right? It's give me my database, um, from the database, give me my DAO. Um, and now I'm, I'm, again, I'm reading from the database. Um, I'm modifying the property um, of the object. And then I can call update on it. Right. And then again, so I get to operate at the method level and, you know, room is taking care of translating those into SQL calls, inserting, you know, grabbing things in the database, returning those objects and updating, in this case, one of the records. And then, um, just so I make sure that if that actually occurred, I then read from the database and then set my text field to show the thing has changed. Now, my example this showed having one. Um, Entity. Um, we can have multiple entities connected in multiple ways, and we'll get some of those later. Um, here's an example I stole from Google's documentation where, right, we have um, you know, another entity book, um, and I now um, generate a more complicated query using multiple tables. So I'm selecting everything from the book table, um, but I'm using joins on, um, you know, from the loan, from the book, loan book, um, and user IDs, right? So I'm, We're not escaping SQL because when we start generating these, these queries, we have to we have to specify um, the query. But and we can have multiple queries um, 
And we can do inner joins and outer joins, all, all the standard SQL things you can do. So an example of using multiple um, entities Defining entities, we, there's a various number of options. Um, in my entity, we can specify what the primary key should be. We can set the name of the table. Um, and we don't, if we don't do this, it'll be the default. The default will be the name of the class and the same thing with we don't need the list of column names if we don't want it. All right. Here's an example where I'm doing everything default. Um, right. So the table is going to be user and the column names are going to be um, last name and first name. Now again, let me point out if I start with this entity and I go like, oh, that's, that, that's just, there's too much typing, I don't care, let's just, just erase, let's get rid of this, let's get rid of all this, right? So I end up with, with this one. Um, that is a change of the table schema. And if I now make these changes and run my application, it will crash on the emulator because I change the schema without changing the version number. If I change a version number, I have to write code to convert from what it was before to what it is now. Um, if you use room, you will do this. I did this even though I like you know, you just start making changes and you forget that change of schema and you run it and it crashes and you go, oh no, what did I do? Um, so I'll be warned if you use room, that will happen to you. Um, we can create um, indices, right? So here we create an index on the last name. Um, Again, if those of you who have dealt with databases before, know what those things are for. Um, create an index on a column or a set of columns. Um, makes it much faster to search for data based on those columns. Um, it also makes it slower to insert data because every time you insert data, you're gonna to have to update the indices. Here, making sure that things are unique. Um, so here, we're saying we don't want, um, we want the value of the last name to be unique. Now we're getting some slightly more interesting material, more complicated. Um, So I got my user, right? And again, primary key. I got rid of, just keep it small, first name. And now I want to add an address, but I want the address to be a separate class, right? So it's embedded. Um, what does it do? Well, um, It basically means that this address class um, is going to be considered part of the same table as user, right? So we're going to get my table. Um, it's going to have an ID column. Um, it's going to have a first name column. It's going to have a street column from the embedded address, right? 
a state column, a city column from right again address, and it's going to have a postcode because I change column info. And note that there's only one entity annotation, which means we only have got one table. So there's no entity up, up there. But we also can have multiple relationships. Um, so we can have one-to-one -one relationships, one-to-many, many-to-many. Um, so we'll look at each one in return. Um, so now here, again, I've got my user again. Um, but notice it's just first name, last name, primary key. Um, I now have an entity for library. Um, and it, 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 both of them are entities. So I'm creating two tables. And when I'm creating two tables, it means I have to, in my database, specify that I'm using two different entities. Um, but now, um, I want to um, basically say each user belongs to a single library, can only belong to one library. Um, have one library, right? Um, so I create a separate class to contain um, that information. Um, and I embed the database user and I need an annotation for the um, relationship between um, my, the parent column is user ID, um, and I think that should have been the user ID, um, and the owner ID comes from here, right? So this is an, a mistake. It should have been just ID. And I then include the library. So once we start doing more complicated relationships, um, things get more complicated. Um, so this is one to one. One to many again. Um, so again, two entities, a user. And there's a playlist. Um, and so we're going to assume that we can have many playlists for a particular user. So again, we need that third class to deal with it. Um, and, and again, the one user is embedded, and then a list of playlists. Um, and then parent column and a column. Many, many again, playlist, song. Um, so one playlist may have many songs, any song can be a different playlist. Um, so what we do is we create a third table, and that third table um, is just two columns. One is the playlist ID and the song ID. For those of you um, who have dealt with SQL before will recognize this is just how you do this in the tables, right? Um, we create another table to hold these relationships. And it's, um, as all, all our letters come, um, room is, um, 
fairly straightforward, but also um, not as rich in functionality as other ones. Um, you know, part of the reason is um, we're dealing with devices. We don't expect it to be a huge, complicated database on the device. Um, and the second reason is that um, when you start getting more and more features in the OR layer to try and make it simpler, um, the OR layer gets more and more complex. Um, so I kept it simple for us. So this is the third time I'm gonna mention this. Um, when you're developing things in the emulator, the em when you rerun your program, the database is not destroyed and recreated. Um, so if you any change in your schema, you change the entity, add a field, delete a field, change the field name, change the column name, add entities, um, you get an error when you run the application. Um, and the solution is you delete the app from the emulator and run it again. In production, we have to use migrations. A simple example. So again, same same example, which I stole and modified sometimes from Google documentation. The user. Um, And now, so this is version one, version two. Um, I want to add the middle name, which means I've added a column, so now I have to deal with that. Um, and now in my room database subclass, I have to um, add a migration um, method and here I'm migrating from version one to version two and I create a method, you know, the interface and I create a method to make the change necessary to the database to go from version one to version two and here I have to just add the column. So we're, again, we're not escaping SQL. Um, we're just giving us a structure where we add SQL at the right spots. Um, and once we've done that, we can just deal with methods. And then I created, I have to add the migrations um, in the build. And there's more examples um, with the Google documentation. Uh, yes. Um, so we've talked about this before. Um, architecture components, right? Um, there's various things I've added. Um, You know, we, we talked about the model before. We talked about the view model um, and live data. Right? So we, we talked about the view model before, live data before, at the, you know, the life cycle where um, now we've talked about room. Um, there's also a page in library so that if there's lots of data, you can just get the page at a time. Um, there's also navigation support now. Um, 
know, if you model um, to the test your activity fragment, um, live data is basically the observer pattern. So when it changes, um, you then update um, the observers. So a great example um, using live data in room. Um, and I do several things. One is I've got a way of modifying the first name or last name. The update button is going to then write that to room. And then I have a text field, which is um, going to be automatically updated um, because of live data. Um, actually, was there, go back, go back. Is that a movie? I don't think so. Oh, yeah, it is. Sorry. Anyway, type in, get rid of it, do an update. So I keep, I'm keeping track of it. I'm keeping a track of the, um, the changes. Right, so live data is going to observe that the room database. Um, so when I update, the user updates the database, right, live data notified and then the live data is going to um, update any listeners they want in this case a text field which is in a text um, always need a day right um, this gets much simpler because I just want um, load by ID find by ID didn't update Um, you know, the names of my fields and my, the IDs of the fields and button. Um, so my main activity um, can update is my button. On the listener, just going to call update. Um, and then I'm going to initialize my database and then I'm going to set my observer. So to initialize my database, right again, I need to did an instance of my database. Um, I didn't worry about initializing it. I want to keep in, you know, make it instance, right? Um, get my database. Um, now, just to add some data, um, I check to see if it's, if it's empty. Um, if it's, if it's empty, then I just add something just so we have a starting point. Um, and then I, um, you know, get person object and I throw that in the person object, right, is a property in my main activity. So that's my initialized database. Um, my updates. Um, all I do is you know I access the current values of my first name and last name text fields and I assign them to my person properties and then I call 
the update method passing the person object. That's it. I don't have to worry about what happens when that um, that is updated. Um, my set observer, um, what do I do? Again, I call load by ID, assign it to a local variable called live, and it's a type live data user. And now we can ask the question, where does this live data come from? And to answer the question, we have to go back. No, no, go back, go back, go back, go back. Yeah. Um, the key thing that I slip by you is on my load by ID. Um, I'm specifying that the return type is a live data on a user object. Now, there's a difference between that and my find by ID. Um, I just return a, a user, user object. Right? And right, this annotation. Um, the compiler that comes across the annotation is going to then generate the right code based on what type I want to turn. This one's going to turn just a plain user object and load by ID is going to return a live data object. So if I want room to return a live data object, I just specify that in my data ac access object. Going back to where we were, um, Since I'm calling load by ID, it's going to return a live data object. Um, and now I need to tell live, uh, live data object what to do when it's updated. Um, and so I pass in, I need to do two things. I need a context and I need um, a Lambda to call to tell it what to do. Um, and it gives it a new value that was live data received. Um, I'm being cautious to, to see if that live data, that object it has any content. If it does, then um, I'm going to just append text to it, append to it. Um, and that's why you kept on seeing each change that happened. Any questions? And again, right, this came from returning that live data in the return call. Right, so big, you know, so again, my update function, it just changes right to database, right? And now, um, and my observer then figures out what to do when things change. And here's, here's the big idea. And this big idea um, is happening everywhere. Um, on the web, we've got React um, from Facebook, which uses this idea. Um, iOS now uses this idea. Now we've got this idea with live data. And the idea is, look, um, there's two separate processes. One is maintaining your data. So the room, right, it, room is words about, okay, now I need to, um, huge, change my data, update the data, access my data. Um, and so when you create your application, you just worry about, okay, 
one complete step is just maintaining that data um, and not worrying about what happens when the data changes. And then you can say, okay, now what, what data do my views need? Oh, now I'm going to create, um, you know, use live data and specify, oh, from this, this, this view depends on this piece of data, right? This view depends on that piece of data. And I set that up and I don't have to worry about, oh, I've just changed the data over here. So now I can to go modify this and modify that and modify this. It's just no. You worry about maintaining your data over here and over here you say what you what your views depend upon and it's whenever your, your application modifies a piece of data over here your views are updated automatically and live data is again activity aware so if your lifecycle aware so if your activity is in the background it's not updated it's not close to the foreground based on any data changes All right, we said that. And so that the big idea here is really called reactive programming. Um, and you know, the goal is to make the applications more robust, more resilient. And one way they do that is make, get rid of all the complications, right? Um, you know, say I've got, you know, a key, you know, a view and I got a piece of data over here. Here's my data. And now I've got a piece of code that's okay. I need to modify the data here. Oh, but wait a minute, this piece of data is in here and here so now i have to go update this and update this and so this code becomes more and more complicated as we get more and more data and more and more complicated views right um every time i write a function to modify the data and i have to go oh modify this and modify that and that becomes error prone Right, so the idea behind reactive programming is here's our data. Um, you know, we we start changing data in various places, and that automatically is going to, you know, broadcast the changes to our views. So, so number of connections we have to worry about. It's, it's slow, is lower, and so fewer problems, fewer errors. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, come on. Yeah, yeah, that's. This whole thing started long, you know, 23 years ago. Um, took a while to become get more traction. Um, Microsoft sort of picked it up in 2009, um, released it a couple years later. Elm is this hotshot um, web framework, um, came out of graduate students, uh, PhD thesis in Harvard. Um, you know, Facebook comes out with React in 2013 using it. Um, 2014, um, the React extensions that Microsoft created were ported to Java. Um, you know, 2017, you know, Flutter came out from Google is the same thing. Flutter is their new cross-platform development toolkit. Um, and since then, you now we've got room. Um, virtual systems come out. Um, this reactive X um, is 
you know, again, it goes back to Microsoft's um, initial attempt, and they, they make several things, um, you know, claim it combines a zipper pattern, iterative pattern, and functional programming. Um, and it goes way beyond what Room does. Um, you can use React um, Rx Java with Room. Um, and the basic idea of reactive programming, you know, can be um, simplified by spreadsheets. And in a spreadsheet, you know, what happens, right? Um, I have a spreadsheet, and I modify a cell, and all the cells that depend upon it change automatically, right? Um, again, we change a cell, all the cells that depend on it will change, right? Every time I change a cell, whatever cell depends upon that one changes. Um, and we don't write code and say, oh, I just changed a cell, now I go modify this, this, and this. It's no, what we do is say cell A depends upon cell B and C. And automatically, when I change cell A, B or C, cell A automatically updated. And that's the idea um, with reactive programming. And that's what we see with live data, right? With room, um, I just say, look, room is going to return this live data, and live data um, will then have observe function, which will modify what's needed to observe. And every time that, that particular piece of data gets changed, um, live data updated for us, and automatically the changes that need to be done will be done. Um, so we see in spreadsheets, Elm is one, Facebook React. Um, Reagent is a closure version of React on um, and you know, Flutter from Google. Um, Fuchsia, um, if you're an Android developer, you should be aware of Fuchsia. It's not clear whatever will come of it. Um, Google has started a third operating system. Um, the first one is, of course, Android. Um, the second one is Chrome for Chromebooks. Um, and they decide they need a third operating system. It's called Fuchsia. It's designed to be a um, very flexible um, operating system for mobile devices. Um, and it, it uses reactive programming and flutter is how you what you use to create user interfaces um, in fuchsia um, and there are various other systems that use reactive programming um, you know rx java is very very i mean it's got 35k stars on github so if you know about github you realize that's a lot of stars, so it's very popular. Um, this version for Swift, this version for Kotlin. Um, yeah, this is just to give you some background. Um, this is Elm. Um, so you can see that I'm moving my mouse around and the mouse location is changing, right? And all we're doing is I need it to use, here I can use white. Um, I'm saying, give me my mouse position, then convert it to text, um, and then lift this basically like live data. It says, okay, make this um, a stream of data. Um, Whenever, whenever my input changes. Um, and that's why when the mouse is moving around, right, the cursor is moving around, we saw that, right, that was changing automatically. And it, this is the entire program that was running to do that. That's it. One line of code to print out the current location of the cursor um, in real time.
and anyone um, who's a web developer will know that in any other system, it's going to take a lot more code to do that than one line of text. Um, now we're doing our time. So this, this reactive programming um, You know, it has sort of two big ideas. One is unifying the data types. You know, thinking of data as a stream of changes rather than, oh, it, I change it here and now it is this, right? So what live data does is just look, right? Here is this piece of data. Don't think of it as a fixed entity, but think of it as something to change over time. And so when it changes, here's what I do. Um, and so I want, wants to unify all these things, um, changing values, that's what live data does, but we also have event handlers, right? Every time I click on something, an event happens, um, they want to treat that as the same type of thing. Um, also asynchronous callbacks, you know, you make a, Call to the network, right, to get information from the data. Um, it comes back later, now you have to do something with it. They want to be able to deal with all these things the same way. Um, another um, idea is one way data flows. In room, we see this as look. I can update the database, I just change the database. So it's, that's a one-way flow is going to modifying the data and I don't worry about anything else. The other one is changes coming out, right, with live data. Um, and that simplifies things. So these, these ideas are spreading and becoming more and more popular. Um, you know, various systems on the web now use it. Now Android and iOS both use it. Um, and we're gonna see it spread you know, further. Um, and what I've shown you with live data is just a, a small little piece of what they're doing. Um, and it can take it, you know, to, to go from what we've been used to, to using reactive programming completely um, takes some mental effort because it, the way we structure programs changes. Live data is not too bad, the, the changes are too great. Um, but again, I just want to warn people about these changes which are slowly percolating through the industry. Any last minute questions? Okay, we knows. Um, so again, next time, come prepare to talk about um, what you want to do for your projects. Um, And then that's it for today. I'll see everyone on Thursday. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.